but it was it was the ice age of fundraising i call it everything was kind of frozen in time for a kind of you know 12 to 18 month period and and in fact no one was making any money because no one was raising any money Hello, this is Abhilash Jaykumar, co-founder and managing director of Trust Vista. On today's Trust Vista talk, I have the pleasure of being joined by Justin Bauer, a founding partner of First Point Equity, a provider of private capital solutions and fundraising advice to alternative asset managers worldwide across private equity, real assets, infrastructure, credit, agriculture, technology, and impact. Justin first started First Point in 2010 and has over 20 years of experience in the alternative asset fundraising industry. He has worked on over 125 fundraisings globally since 1999. Prior to starting First Point, he was the co-head of Europe and managing principal for Park Hill Group. And prior to that, he was with UBS's private equity funds group. Justin, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be, uh, to be speaking with you today. Now, you know, in talking about your bio, you've had a very long career in a very focused space within this alternative assets world, which is fundraising. And you know, I've met a lot of folks who are in this uh, part of the industry and in raising capital as more capital is being raised and more funds are being employed, but very few people who've had basically their entire career in this space. Can you maybe talk to us about how you got into this industry in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like I, I should have retired by now had I been good at my job, but um, yeah, it, it, I, I fell into this career really. Uh, I was a banker trained at a British investment bank called Samuel Montague. Uh, which was part of the uh, HSBC Investment Banking Corporation eventually. So I came out of university with uh, no real knowledge of finance at all. Uh, I wanted to be a doctor, so I read something called uh, medical geography. It basically meant I played a lot of sport, which I was paid very seriously at a young age. Uh, and I managed to get myself into the graduate trainee program of the merchant bank uh, called Samuel Montague. So I did my kind of basic M&A training. I uh, went through the graduate program there, and I realized pretty quickly that actually investment banking was not for me. Uh, I found the lack of entrepreneurial uh, dynamic there uh, and the quite rigid structure, particularly when you were a junior kind of analyst and associate coming through, uh, of less kind of uh, um, uh, interest. Uh, although I knew that I always wanted to be uh, in the financial world, and obviously mathematics for me was one of my my, my kind of core my core subjects. So uh, I happened to be have done my four years there when this dot com boom um, started. So that was kind of 98, 99, and I actually went over uh, and I joined Vertex Management, um, the VC fund that is the VC arm of uh, Singapore Technologies at the time. And as a very young guy, I helped to set up the London office with some senior folk from Singapore and spent a lot of my time between London and, uh, and Silicon Valley. And we put that fund out in the dot-com boom uh, and we all thought we were worth an absolute fortune, which on paper we were. Uh, and about 12 months later, we realized that I had crashed a lot of it to zero. So uh, that was the run. Uh, and I came back kind of from Silicon Valley thinking I learned a hell of a lot and, and I realized how much more I have to learn. Uh, but I actually wanted to be a, uh, an orthopedic surgeon. So I, I started medical school again in London uh, and was in the process of selling my flat and moving back to live with my parents as an impoverished uh, kind of medical student. And, and I met uh, on a plane uh, uh, down to um, uh, one of the conferences in Germany, uh, an individual called Tongi Cotton. He used to be at the UBS placement agent business. He then uh, spent the rest of his career really um, at, uh, at Atlantic Pacific. And he told me about uh, why he was leaving UBS and that kind of role. And I thought, what well, I'd raised some money before. I understood it from the private capital markets. I'd been at Samuel Montague Private Equity, which obviously became HSBC Private Equity, now Montague Private Equity. Uh, and uh, UBS were kind of setting up this fundraising business, this placement agent business to compete with Credit Suisse and Merrill Lynch and a few other firms at the time. So I had a couple of interviews there and I kind of fell into the job, really. Uh, and they, the idea originally was I could do this for a little bit of time, uh, probably put myself into a slightly better financial position before I go back to my five years of studying as a medical student again. Uh, and the rest is history. So thoroughly enjoyed. Be clear, that you have not opportunity. finished medical school yet. No, I had, I had to then extract myself from having just started medical school um, uh, to join UBS at the time under uh, 
James Moore and Richard Alsop and, and the team that we were building there. So I was one of the original people in into that business, uh, and we really kind of built built the business from around a group of uh, six or seven of us uh, into into what it is. You mentioned wanting to be in an entrepreneurial environment, and that wasn't what you found in your first career as an investment banking analyst. But when you say brands like UBS and Park Hill, Blackstone, people think big firms, but you know UBS set up that team in '98, and you joined in 2000. You know Park Hill was started in 2004, and you joined in 2006. And so you've seen the journey of, you know, being at a startup to growing and being established in a brand. Can you kind of talk about what happened at your time in UBS, the transition to a Park Hill that merged with Blackstone, the transition to starting First Point? Yeah, absolutely. I think look, every, everywhere you go and every uh, place that you're at, you learn from the institution itself and you learn from people around you. And I think you still learn uh, and I'm still learning today. Um, but I think it does help define you in, in, in where you think you're best suited to what you do and why. So I think learning through those organizations and through those people uh, really helps to get you to where you eventually end up and hopefully where you kind of accelerate in your career. So for UBS, we were part of the equity sales team. So not, not stuck within corporate finance and investment banking like many uh, of the placement agent firms were or maybe are today. And I think on the sales side, there's a much, we sat right next to the big trading floor um, at UBS and um, up in Liverpool Street, but much more entrepreneurial uh, style culture. There's no kind of banding. If you're very good, you can go through the, the ranks very quickly, which I, I did along with some of my colleagues, but really an open book. You know, here's the telephone, here's the dealing desk, here's your licenses in place, here's what we're trying to build. I'm half Norwegian, you cover the Nordic market and others, pick up the phone, start calling and fly. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it, there was no structure uh, to begin with, apart from we knew what we had to achieve, but how we got there was up to some very well qualified or, or certainly very driven individuals to go and achieve it. Um, and as I said, you know, I was kind of new into the team there. I was, I was younger at the time and I just picked up a book of uh, investors outside of Switzerland and Germany. Uh, and I covered most of the rest of uh, uh, Europe and, and half of the UK. And there were a two or 300 names in it, go call them, go meet them, go figure it out, figure out what they like and figure out the industry and, and what really makes people tick. And that that was obviously two decades ago. And what investors in Europe were looking for at that stage was very different from what they're looking for today, as that industry has matured uh, and the programs have matured. And indeed, the portfolios of these pension plans have matured. So we really built the business at UBS on raising uh, European capital for the likes of Blackstone, Apollo, uh, JW Childs, uh, Candover, and a few of the kind of uh, 3i, a few of the kind of brand name funds back then. Uh, and then we grew into kind of Avenue and Aries and, and various other, and then more kind of mid market funds across Europe and the US. Um, and it was a great run uh, and it was successful and we did very well. And um, as, uh, as some GPs will always remind us, we were successful because we were raising their money. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and looking back at the time, we thought, no, no, I'm successful, Paul. We've been successful because we're great here at UBS. But obviously, the quality of the product is critical in this industry. And you learn that going through. And it was a good run. But, you know, like, like many organizations and, and, uh, and institutional platforms, again, you're quite kind of, uh, it, it's quite structured. There's, there's many ceilings in place. And I think if you have that entrepreneurial drive, uh, and, you, and you're prepared to take that risk, um, you know, there were other things waiting. So, you know, Park Hill Group had been kind of roughly formed by obviously some of the, the five people that spun out of Atlantic Pacific. But in Europe in 05, we were already talking to uh, um, uh, those people at Blackstone and at Park Hill Group because at UBS, we had raised the previous Blackstone fund. So they were well aware of who we were at UBS in Europe. And obviously they had to build out that Europe and Asia team, which, which we really ran from the London office. So it was a great opportunity to go leave and join and leave a bank and join a partnership. Now that is the next stage for me, which is like, how do you become an equity partner within an organization? Um, what is it to be to be sitting on the executive committee as you come in? Uh, not really that you have to run or control things, but you're, you're at that, the table when you're making important decisions of how you're doing. And that is the next step of learning um, really how in any business, I think, how you have to uh, develop, um, uh, mature, uh, understand in a broader context and a broader scenario uh, what, what it requires to actually run a business like that as a, as a, as a, we ran it at Park Hill Group, even though Blackstone were a minority investor, 
it was the partners of Park Hill running that business and what was required to make that successful. So that was the next kind of entrepreneurial step was to be within a partnership uh, and within a boutique platform. But that grew very quickly. As you know, it was the boom years of raising money. 06, 07, 08, couldn't get better. Um, you know, uh, I think we always thought that Blackstone at some stage would be the natural acquirer for us. We always thought that the in-house IR team at Blackstone would uh, would grow, which it obviously has significantly now. Um, but we didn't, I think, quite realize that Blackstone would IPO in 2007 and that we would be um, kind of a, a part of that process where indeed they they bought the majority of the firm at the IPO. Um, now, that was a tremendous event for um uh, for the, uh, the 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 founding partners and uh, of of Park Hill Group at the time, there's a journey there. The stock was at 31. It went down to kind of three or four, you know, very soon after during the global financial crisis. Um, that looks like an insane valuation now when you see Blackstone up at about 115 today, and just the huge AUM growth that um, these. Uh, these um, extremely large asset managers and, and extremely successful asset managers have 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 managed to uh, to control. So that was a great process. And then there was the global financial crisis. And I think without that, I probably would not have left Park Hill Group. Um, but it was it was the ice age of fundraising. I call it. Everything was kind of frozen in time for a kind of you know 12 to 18 month period. And and in fact, no one was making any money because no one was raising any money. And it was an interesting time for me to think. I really want to have um, not necessarily my own firm, but I really want to work around with a group of people in a much smaller context. Uh, I'd like to kind of be a part of um, molding what that firm looks like and why. Uh, and that was the next step. And in, in, I realized in any maturing industry, um, you can have some of these big players around. Uh, they're still around some of them and they're still great firms. Uh, but also there was room for many, many different types, of, I think, of boutique strategies. And for me, it was it was it was interesting to figure out which clients would want to work with me as an individual at the time, and, and if I built a business, why would I build it, and what what would uh, fund managers look for going forwards in a kind of more boutique service, you know? And fast forward a decade, there's there's a hundred or more boutiques out there, you know, doing what we do. So I, I left and had some time out. Um, you know, needless to say, at these larger groups, you're raising, you know, a large number of funds every year. It can get pretty stressful. Um, but it, I also didn't want to kind of go back to being to working within a large in institution, which is what happened after the kind of IPO. Um, it was much more that I wanted to keep it even more boutiquey, I think, and even more of a kind of partnership based model in, in the way that I wanted to, I think, um, enjoy the rest of my career in this industry and going forward. So it allowed me the ability, ability to come out. It allowed me the ability to select the right people that I wanted to work with, the right strategy, the right culture. I learned a hell of a lot from Dan Prendergast um, at uh, Park Hill Group. He's uh, tragically no longer with us, um, but he taught me a lot about the good and the bad ways to run businesses uh, and he was i learned a lot of the uh, of the good things from him which maybe i had not seen through the rest of my financial career up to that stage um so that was a great interest and and you know but the first deal uh, i won it was just me and, and a laptop at the time was the riverstone fund five it was a 7.7 .7 billion dollar fund i was up at credit Suisse against credit Suisse, ubs park hill group etc and I won that mandate as an individual, but for a very specific reason. It's because not the other, because the other firms aren't great. Of course they are. Um, it was because the Riverstone were looking for a particular way of raising money in a particular region. It was a European only mandate. And they wanted to kind of have that solution provided to them, uh, which was never going to be a large global um, banking or large um, privately owned boutique kind of uh um, placement agent firm providing that service and they wanted to have it quite kind of tight quite well structured and it, it proved my kind of concept that I think as we were going through there will be some firms that will build massive in-house teams and others that will start to use much more boutique -y or regional based approach to what they do likewise it was also very clear to me that look you know not every deal is a success and uh, the more deals you do by its very nature the more deals that aren't successful uh, and those managers, I think, had quite a difficult time within their own businesses. And, and it was clear to me that the, the kind of smaller and middle end of the market were going to look for much more boutique-based, professionalized uh, 
either local but maybe global boutique firms to raise money for them uh, rather than um, uh, kind of the larger the larger institutions or the larger organizations uh, and that became uh, very apparent very quickly and before I knew it I was um, inundated in, in, an, in a advisory mandates in distribution mandates and I realized that I couldn't do this by myself and it gave me the confidence that I could hire people around me and start to build a firm slowly I think with with ambition but with caution um, uh, I think through it quite uh, methodically uh, and build first point into what it is today and, and obviously step one of that was to to join forces with uh, my, my co-founder Julian Pearson and really sit down and think through what he had been doing at JP Morgan, what we wanted to achieve together. Uh, and that's been a, a, a very enjoyable, uh, successful, interesting time. And I hope we're doing good things for good people. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll continue to. Yeah, well, your track record certainly speaks to uh, the quality of your team and the success that you've had. You know, you, you mentioned two specific things in what you do, advisory and distribution. And if you kind of look back at this industry, you know, 20 years ago, the word industry wasn't even used, right, for private equity. And it was much more about distribution, right? You had lar large funds, you had a select universe of the LPs, a select universe of GPs, and it was about distribution. And, you know, when times were great, those, you know, top placement agent firms could be picky about which mandates they wanted to take on, right? People didn't want to take on first-time funds. They do fund three, four guys who had great track records who would almost sell themselves. So, you know, the point you made earlier, is it the advisor that's doing all the great work or is the product, right? It's certainly an element of both, but it's a lot easier if you have great product. And so as there's been a proliferation of GPs, LP types, and boutique advisory firms, the advice takes on a much more valuable component. Um, so when you look at who your client base is, how many of, how does it skew between first time funds or, you know, first time raising, you know, a different type of institutional LP capital versus the fund five type of firms? We're trying to round out a different type of LP base. Yeah, and I think that's a really uh, uh, important question because I think that's where the boutiques really have 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 cut their trade, which is you know it, in these larger organisations, it, it is quite a, a process, right? And it's a process which it's one process, and it kind of one process fits all. And if you go through that um, that process and it works for you, it's great. And if it doesn't, you know you're kind of um, you're struggling a bit uh, and my view and if you look at our strap line at first point we've had it from uh, the kind of word go is bespoke experienced and effective so we believe that the the, the most efficient and effective way to raise capital uh, for our clients is to develop a very bespoke strategy that is all about the advisory side it's about advising on who i'm not going to well, I remember when Steve uh, Schwartzman, we were raising money at UBS and, you know, along came the kind of Blackstone pitch book. It's like, well, that's the pitch book. We don't have any say in that at all. And why would we? Um, but obviously from some of the first time funds, second time funds, spin out funds, uh, you know, we're writing the documents from scratch. Uh, and part of that is really that kind of as the market has matured, you have to make sure that you've positioned this product correctly. You have to make sure that the GP can actually communicate what they do correctly in the way that the LPs and with, with some kind of LP lingo understand what it is that they do. We know the process that LPs are gonna go through on the due diligence side, so therefore that has to be prepared so that they can go through that, you know, not, not just a tick box exercise, but go through every aspect of that due diligence. Um, so the, uh, the upfront advisory for us is everything. And, and as it happens, probably about, uh, I would say three quarters of what we've done have been first time funds, second time funds or spin out funds. So you advise them from really, you know, which lawyer to use, uh, what's the best fund structure, you know, what, what should I watch out for as I'm thinking through hiring people or hiring lawyers, um, setting up, um, setting up my store, I, you know, really evaluating and identifying our, our, our core strengths of value add, you know, how do we, how do we communicate them? How do we get that on a, uh, on a pitch deck? You know, how do, how does that relate through to the PPM? You know, what is it that LPs want to know? And, and also LPs wanted to know different things 15 years ago, as you said, you know, the things that people were focused on 15 years ago is you're developing um, these programs and building out their, uh, their portfolio of, of, of funds is very different today. And the level of due diligence and detail that LPs go through today is significantly more enhanced and significantly more detailed uh, and in a way challenging, but I think on a fiduciary duty kind of required if you think through where the market is today and has matured to. 
Um, so, on the, so the advice is really, we don't separate into two, right? It's not like we have some advisory people and have some salespeople. Um, at first point, everybody does everything. You'll notice that we're a very senior heavy team uh, with partners and MDs uh, taking up the majority of the people at the firm. And that's because we believe that those uh, brains and that experience uh, are what leads to us to, to, to be able to, to be bespoke and efficient in what we do, to give best of breed advice, to understand what the market's looking for, to help the GPs and educate the GPs uh, on what they, uh, on the approach they should take. And over half of the uh, senior individuals of the firm at First Point Equity have been LPs previously. And I think that gives us a real advantage in the way that we communicate with our GPs, the way we position with our LPs, the networks around it. And I think that that is just um, that that advisory work and positioning work is just very much hand in glove with with how we distribute the um, uh, the funds that we work with. But you do three fourths of your mandates as first time funds, I think, really says you work for a living. Right? There are a lot of placement agents out there who won't touch a first time fund with a 10 foot pole. Right. Um, and one of the challenges for that is a lot of LPs look at a first time fund and say, I don't want to take partnership risk, have these partners work together, uh, you know, let alone individual track records. How is that partnership going to function as a group of partners? Now, you had mentioned previously in working at Park Hill was your first exposure to be a partnership. And you, know, you learned a lot there. Now that you're advising first time funds and presumably first time partners, what are the lessons you take from working in a partnership that you try to pass on to your clients? as far as best practices in operating as partners? Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, that's a good question because it's, it's not for me really to tell a GP how they should work together as partners. I think if they haven't figured that out already, we probably wouldn't be raising any money for them. Um, but I think, that I, I think the reality is, is this is a long-term industry. Uh, and if I critique myself as a, as, as a younger person within the industry, you know, you, you know you're ambitious, you're highly kind of um, uh, motivated, you have a lot of energy, but you, you, you kind of in certain circumstances think you, should, you can run when you should be walking. Uh, and, and actually you need that kind of uh, that experience and that maturity to step back and think, well, you know, sometimes you have to be a little bit thoughtful and, and we always we always make the phrase, you, you, you've got the GP there and the kind of um, the horses and the stables and they want to go uh, because that's what they are. You know, they, they want to go. They want to go do deals and they want to they want to invest and, 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 and generate returns for themselves and for their LPs. But actually, sometimes you've got to hold those horses back because you've got to really have everything aligned uh, and everything properly structured. So. My, my, my view with the, with on a partnership basis, I think as a partnership and when you're thinking longer term and you're not just an, an employee of a firm, uh, you're really thinking about what do I need to do now to think through what is the best thing for me to make sure that in one year, three years, five years and 10 years, I'm reaching my goals. So I always tell the kind of earlier stage managers that we work with, um, whether they're emerging managers or whether they're just people who have spun out just take a breath and have a think. What are you trying to achieve? What is the 10-year game plan here? Because there are no prizes for slipping up on the stepping stones in month three and sixth for now, because we haven't thought about what we are doing, or we haven't structured it correctly, or we haven't positioned it correctly. You know, work back from 10 years. Yes, you want to be, in general, uh, a, 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 a manager of... Um, you know, multi-million uh, dollar, pound, euro fund. Uh, it may be a hundred, it may be a billion, it may be 10 billion. But if you work back from that, what do you need to do today? Don't rush these decisions today on the people you hire, uh, on the structure that you have, uh, on the strategy that you have. If you get this right, you will all do very well. You'll all make plenty of money. Uh, and hopefully you'll make a lot of LPs very happy and, and obviously service those underlying retail clients in general, you know, of, of, those, uh, of those allocations and of those funds. Um, so, so, so think longer term and then work backwards, but don't try and rush it straight away. That, that for me has been, the, um, uh, has been the lesson. Yeah, I think that's great advice. You know, we're all in this finance industry and everyone understands the concept of compounding, money compounds. But success compounds, and you. It, but the key variable in that formula for compounding is is time, right? It will compound if you give it time, but if you don't give it that time, you no, know, it's not going to happen. You can talk about 
Blackstone stocks once being three dollars and now 120. And people might say, oh, I wish I had bought that stock, but would they have had the patience to hold it? Right? And I think that's the same thing with careers and partnerships. Can you say what I'm doing today isn't for tomorrow's benefit or next month's benefit, but I'll re reap the rewards 10, 15, 20 years later? And I think this goes to the heart of being an entrepreneur, right? And what you were doing earlier in your career and why you've set down this path. And so when you meet these GPs, you know, do you evaluate this about them when you decide who you want to take on as a client or not? Are these the type of things you're doing initially in part of your diligence to understand who's going to be successful in going to market or not? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you are only as good as your last deal. Um, I think our, certainly for a firm like First Point Equity, you know, we don't have that that kind of institutional brand name of a of a of a of a you know a UBS or a Credit Suisse, you know, kind of introducing us to hundred clients every year. We actually win a lot of our business direct through GP and LP referrals. You know, I don't have a team of you know 10, 20 origination people traveling around the world trying to scour every city for every new manager that comes out. It comes to us because I hope over a 20-year period for myself, uh, some of my other partners, but specifically over a, a more than a decade at First Point, we've earned the reputation that people want to refer deals to us uh, because of the success that we've had, but because of the integrity and the quality of the advice and, and, and um, service that we've given. So it's, it's super important to us that when we evaluate people, when we evaluate partners, when we evaluate the strategy, you know, do we actually think they will last the test of time? Do we think they have thought through the important aspects of what they're trying to achieve? Uh, a lot of people say, you know, well, you know, we're in the investment business. And I went, you're not. You're in the business of investing. And you need to make that mindset shift pretty quickly. Because if you don't structure yourself to be in the business of investing, this may be a short-lived thing. And what do I mean by that? Um, fairness, integrity, openness, transparency. Um, as we look at partners, look, th there are sharp elbows in every partnership. Um, there are conflicting personalities. You hope that different personalities come together to make it a, a better engine and a better decision-making process. But it's fraught with sharp elbows in our industry. Everybody knows that. So the question is, when we look at teams that have either spun out or come together um, or the additions they may make, it's really about judging as well. What are the personalities of the people that we're working with? Um, you know, what are the kind of um, uh, the cultural patterns? What are the behavioral patterns? You know, how does that change? I remember talking to, I think it was uh, Kathleen Bacon and Helen Steers more than 15 years ago on this. You know, who's really studying when they invest in the next fund of a, of a GP? Maybe that, that might be Roman numeral four, five or six. If they've done well, they've made plenty of money. Who's evaluating the behavioral patterns of the individual partners at the firm? So it goes back to understanding, you know, what is the culture of that firm? Am I going to be proud to represent them? Am I going to look, is something going to happen that's going to damage my reputation as an individual or as first point? Um, you know, how, how, how much detail can we drill down to? There's always an element of risk somewhere. There's always a judgment call somewhere that, that we are making when we take on uh, a client, the client are making when they're taking on us, then the LP is making investing in the fund. But I think if you can, if you can really get your arms around the, uh, the main aspects of decision making process and the fundamentals of why you are working with the people you're working for, which goes above and beyond just a, an Excel spreadsheet of returns achieved, but really how they're achieved, with who, in what methodology, within what culture, we evaluate a lot of that. And it, that's very important to us. If we can switch gears for a minute here, it's been an interesting past 18 months. Um, what have you seen happening in the market, you know, both from the LP perspectives, new fund perspectives, you know, which sectors have been more successful, which type of GPs have been more successful? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's been an, it's been a um, uh, it's been a um, a very interesting 18 months. Uh, it, it was it was it was interesting through the financial crisis just before and just after you know what was being raised, but if we think through you know really since COVID uh, pandemic kicked off and I actually fell very ill with COVID back in March last year so I can I can assure you that it is out there um, and uh, it, it took me out for 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 many weeks it needed some medical intervention and some uh, an ambulance to help etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but I was blessed and I recovered and I I, I, I I had long COVID for quite some time, 
but we had a lot of time at home to think through how do we run this business and why. And I think, you know, in the short term, I think initially there was this kind of uh, this freeze, I suppose. It's another kind of, it was like another uh, mini ice age um, within the fundraising business because LPs and GPs had to really assess the new market environment. And I think there was a recalibration. Um, what what do we do now and why? No one really understands COVID back in, in, in March kind of 2020. What's going to happen? What does it mean for our capital? What does it mean for our business itself? What does it mean for the portfolios, the money which we've got in the ground, the dry powder? I think there was a lot of internal reflection there. Um, and I think that, that, that clearly led to um, a kind of delay in fundraising timelines, uh, no matter who you were. I think at the initial stages, there was... Um, there was a, a real impact. And I think on the on the maybe the earlier funds, the fund ones and the fund twos or the spin out funds, I think there's no doubt that those fundraisers just kind of automatically increased by six months, uh, I think, in some instances longer. Um, but unlike that kind of global financial crisis, there was no denominator effect. Uh, in fact, you know, the markets crashed uh, a little bit, corrected, but then it was, it didn't take that long before they were back to where they were. So we weren't dealing with the denominator effect where there just, there just was a lack of allocation. There was allocation. The question is, what did I do with it and how? Um, and then we got through to the whole, you know, what can I invest in? Uh, what can I do? You know, and again, this is the short term, you know, for the first kind of six months. So what can I do? There's remote working. It's quite clear that we wouldn't be able to travel for a bit. Uh, we thought that might get better, but it got longer. There was lockdown. I think everybody felt the kind of, um, you know, some of the pain of homeschooling um, or, or, or just having to rethink through uh, how they operate as a business and hold their teams together. And that's across the, uh, obviously across the globe. Um, so I think there was no doubt that first time funds at that stage were kind of like, listen, we need to put this on hold for a bit. You know, we can't meet you. We can't do full due diligence. At least we don't think we can. And there was real, really kind of a, a kind of a flight to kind of like, well, what have we got in our portfolio? Who's 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 raising money again and where are we comfortable to commit money at this stage? So in the medium term, kind of from post summer last year and onwards, I think there was a real recognition that the pandemic would continue. Uh, I think there was it wasn't going to go away quickly, uh, that there was going to be uncertainty, but the world wasn't going to come to an abrupt end. And in fact, as the vaccines came through, I think it kind of lessened some of the uh, the worry or nervousness, the anxiety that the investment community had. You know, and clearly, um, you know, the 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 the, uh, the virus has proved to be um, uh, a real challenge. You know, we've got millions of people who have who have unfortunately died now uh, in different countries around the world. Uh, with different programs but i think people for the first time thought look business will continue the flows of capital will continue yes then we might get logistically stuck a little bit in some of the flows of goods and services but on the financial side as you know that often leads to kind of opportunity so what we saw very much in that medium term was uh, a huge amount of money going to existing relationships um, and a flight to quality. The market just bifurcated quicker than I've ever seen it bifurcate before. And what does that mean? I mean, if you look at um, uh, if you look at some of the funds that were raised, uh, there's been an, I mean, there's been if you pick your kind of the, the large brand name funds, they've been able to raise their tens of million billions, if not 20 billion, if not more, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, I think there is a doubling down from LPs and the managers they know. There already was a kind of big doubling down of allocations to managers who are performing well, to co-investments, even to some direct investments. Um, and if we fast forward again, um, uh, you know, again, I think with the use of accelerated technology through Zoom, through Microsoft Teams, through the ability and understanding very quickly, actually, uh, of how we can use uh, technology to continue the way we do our business and, and, and meet with people and, and diligence people. Um, uh, I, think, I think that's just kind of continued. And the fundraising so far, I mean, I think I've got some stats here, but I think up to June this year, I think about 450 billion has been raised. Um, and we're still in the midst of COVID, even though it's kind of, we think in some areas improving, but really into the whole world, I think is supported and improves. There's, there isn't a solution for everybody. Um, I think we need to focus on that broader solution for, for all those kind of uh, emerging markets for, for, the, um, for those who are affected most by it, for those who are challenged in the, in the, in the, in the lower earnings uh, group of people around the world. But 450 
billion plus has been raised in the first six months. And that's the highest sum for a period of about five or six years. Uh, and the 10 largest funds raised uh, 150 billion of that. So one third of the, of the capital raise, which is an outstanding amount of money, went to the 10 largest funds. And that is the bifurcation that I, that I mentioned earlier. And it's been very interesting to see how that has happened. Um, and that's been across um, uh, private equity, infrastructure, uh, secondary funds, which have been growing uh, from, from, from strength to strength. But also we found a slight change into a, a quicker, uh, I think, pivot towards more impact funds, towards more focus on ESG, towards renewables. And I think that's the other thing that we've seen come through. And it's probably long overdue that uh, investors in our industry, even though there has been, I think, a good and advanced focus on ESG uh, through the private equity and the, and the private capital markets, I think that has really accelerated. And now I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that actually um, a, a, a far greater percentage of the money allocated to alternative assets can go towards um, impact strategies. And it's something that we've done very much on the renewable side. We've closed a 1.1 billion uh, euro fund uh, called Q Energy in Spain uh, that does uh, solar and wind in Spain and Germany. Uh, first time they, it was their fund four. It's the first time they've ever raised proper institutional capital. We met them remotely. We raised all the money remotely and we closed it remotely. I think there was one investor uh, of, the, of all the new investors who actually traveled to Madrid to do a physical on site. The rest of it was done uh, kind of remotely uh, and through the data room. We're also I working for that. Is they just wanted a trip to Madrid. Well, everybody wants a trip to Madrid, right? Um, especially during the, the, the cooler months, because it's, um, it, it's such a lovely place to be. You know, we won a mandate um, uh, over in America, which uh, really focuses on uh, uh, climatic themed infrastructure, something that uh, is becoming more prevalent. Actually, we've just taken on a new mandate called Blue Horizon, which is uh, a um, sustainable foods uh, uh, fund. It's their fourth generation fund, but they're looking to raise money for kind of alternative you know, meat-based proteins, uh, sustainable foods. And it's something which is just gaining more and more traction. And when you talk to these impact buckets, they are developing themselves and trying to figure out what they should do. And it's all about impact and return. And I think the strategies and the people and the experiences out there to do that. So it's, it's been, um, that's the kind of short and medium kind of view. And I think the, I think in general, in, 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 uh, in kind of, um, environments of uncertainty there is always that flight to quality um, there is always that flight to uh, the top brand name funds whether you happen to be slightly smaller uh, or whether you happen to be um, you know one of the mega houses out there and i think that will continue for some time uh, and then i think as things open up a bit you know we'll get back to seeing uh, interest in 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 those uh, uh, asset managers and kind of adding on um, newer, maybe higher alpha or slightly different strategies within their portfolio to complement the kind of the core holdings that they may have. Um, but but I think for us, it's it, it, it's an inter it's interesting for our industry. And and if we actually critique our industry, you know what we do as placement agents, what private equity firms do to raise money, you know the flying has been very significant over the past twenty years or more. Um, in any industry, it has been. Uh, but if we look around, sometimes, um, you know, you might have to go to the same LP and fly there kind of, you know, four or five or six times, you know, to close that ticket. I think there will be a lot more focus uh, on, on that travel, on the climatic impacts of how we raise money. And I, I, as I said to, the, to everyone at first point, so if you really think through, you know, the LPs, are, are kind of demanding the GPs to have very, very strong ESG policies in place. And, and, and not just policies, but policies that are me measurable, uh, policies that you can actually um, uh, identify areas of weakness or improvement. So that there really is a concept of how, how do you measure your ESG policy and the impact that it's having. Um, but I also think that you know, LPs, you know, being the providers of capital must turn around to this industry and say, we don't want you to fly as much. It is not right that GPs fly to us so much to raise money. The, 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 the pollution, the climatic impact of, of, of those journeys, if we can lead 
uh, you know, kind of the industry in the way that we, we raise money and make it maybe a little bit more virtual, a little bit more data room based uh, with the technology we have, use that technology. There's no doubt that people do business with people and there's no doubt that we have to meet. But I think one or two meetings is sufficient. I don't think four or five meetings is required. And I think the LP should look at their own ESG policy and think, what can we do as an LP uh, to also be more ESG compliant uh, ourselves and think through that? So I think travel will open up. It has already. I think travel will always be a part of the placement agent in the fundraising world. But I think there's no reason why the amount of travel, and I've spoken to many, many people in the placement agent world and many GPs, there's no reason why it should even, even be half of what it has been historically. And I look forward to, 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 to seeing how that kind of pans out. And I think every industry has the responsibility to focus on those climatic themes uh, issues that we have today. It's everywhere. You see it in the news every day. Uh, and what can we do to help and what can we do to continue to provide that, those kind of returns to, comp to continue to raise money, continue to have great partnerships between LPs and GPs, but continue to make sure that we're doing the right thing at the same time as, as, as achieving good returns for the, uh, for the underlying investors. Yeah. So first point is 20 people now. It's been just over 10 years. Where do you see first point in 10 years? Um, very interesting. Uh, it, it's hard to judge. I was asked this question uh, kind of through through COVID, and I think you, 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 just to go back on one of other questions, you know, why why are people spinning out? I think I think I think they are thinking. I think COVID and working at home has made them think about what do I really want to achieve in my career? You know, how old am I? What how long have I got left? What interests me? What doesn't? Where do I want to be financially? And I think I think the ability to have some headspace, maybe uh, without maybe the travel, and actually think through what we're trying to achieve as individuals, I think has given people a um, uh, a kind of uh, just a uh, just to reconnect with 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 what their true thoughts are, and that space and time. I remember the VC world, we always had half a day off a week just to think about things, not to make any investment decisions, not to think about. Um, you know, the last pitch that came in, but just to think about where's the world going? What might be interesting? What don't I have that I might like to have? You know, I remember when I was at Vertex, I, I had a WAP phone and we, and we bought a can of Coke from a Coke machine with, a, with the Nokia WAP phone at the time. And we're like, oh my goodness, nothing has changed hands. I've just, I've dialed the number, I've typed in the code and this Coca-Cola's fallen out of the machine. It was mind blowing that this could happen on every train station in the world. I mean, this was 22 years ago. Now it's like, well, of course, you can do everything with your mobile phone today. You know, there, there, there were no apps, you know, there were no, there were no iPhones, et cetera. Um, so I think as we, as we think through that also, I think they, 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 you know, it's frothy out there, right? It's a boom. People like to spin out and raise their own funds when there's lots of money around. Now, although the market is, or the market is bifurcated, if you, if you have the right ingredients, then I think obviously it's a very interesting time to, to raise money. Where will first point be in, two, in, in 10 years time? For me, uh, my legacy within in this industry, uh, and I am a tiny minnow in the whole of the placement agent and private equity world, but if I can leave a firm that can continue on uh, without me, if I can leave a firm of, of, of the culture that we have, the real friendship, the camaraderie, um, I think the, um, the high integrity, uh, the enjoyment, if I can leave a firm with a, with a group of people who can continue that through, uh, off when I'm not here um, and, and, and for the generations to come. And I'm not saying that we can all build businesses that are around for 50 years. But that would make me very proud. And for me, again, I, I learn a lot about culture at the various firms I've been with. I learn a lot about people at the various firms I've been with. There are some that I respect highly. There are some that I've learned not to follow maybe the, the, the methodology that they, uh, that they kind of installed. Um, but if I could leave a, a well-performing, highly respected and regarded firm that can continue way beyond me and, 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 and really with the people in it being uh, happy uh, and having that environment uh, where they can all enjoy their working career, that they can all um, achieve some of their own wealth creation strategies uh, and look after their children, their children's children, that's great, right? That wouldn't, wouldn't anybody want that. But you also, to with the word partnership, again, to a previous question, you have to know in the partnership how to manage that partnership. And part of that is obviously not being too greedy, right, at the top. You, you need to know when you have to dilute, when you have to have other partners involved, when you have to hand over responsibility, you know, when it's your time just to kind of um, step aside or, or add value in a different area. And I think that's how partnerships 
uh, are maintained and can, and can exist successfully in the future rather than just come and go. You talked about thinking long term and certainly you are thinking long term. You know, I think very few entrepreneurs think about how they'll have succession planning in and it's not just their firm once they started it is the firm of everyone who's going to be a part of that story so you know it's very much been our privilege to be your partners at, at trust vista and we'll look forward to continuing the journey with you justin thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today thank you very much and thank you to you and trust vista for all the great help that you give us and we really uh, enjoy and appreciate that relationship and great talking to you today